My second prayer is, Lord, help me to live the life that I am learning. I invite the Holy Spirit to fill my life and to empower me so that I can live that life that I am learning from Jesus. And my third prayer and commitment is that in the course of the day, as I live that life that I'm learning, I will have an opportunity to lead another person to Jesus. I will help them to deepen their knowledge and experience of Christ, or I'll help them in another way to come to Christ. So three things I pray every day, Lord, help me today to learn from Jesus, to learn of Jesus and to learn from Jesus. And the second is that as I learn of Jesus and from Jesus, I will live for Jesus. But ultimately, I want to be empowered and used of the Holy Spirit so that I can lead another person to experience the very life of Christ. So, and this is the part that I want to really encourage you that this is not a very easy discipline, training yourself to learn. And my first recommendation is for you to start a journey of learning of Jesus, especially right now I'm using the book of John. Every week I pick a chapter of John, I read it, meditate on it, and try to draw from it something I can learn of Christ and to live. And what I want to suggest to you are two things. Number one, that you find somebody else within this group and the two of you commit to learn of Jesus and to learn from Jesus through the book of John. So I'll be recommending each of you find somebody, Brian and Jovin, join together and commit that every week you will individually look through the book of John. So John chapter one, each of you will commit some time to look at the whole of John chapter one and then sit down and maybe scribble and identify what am I learning of Jesus in John chapter one. And as you do it individually, you make time in the week where you can be able to spend maybe half an hour together and exchange. Jovin, what did you learn of Jesus? Brian, what did you learn of Jesus from John chapter one? And then as you exchange those learnings, then you can also answer the second question. What did you learn from Jesus that you have incorporated in your own life? What this does is to help you to affirm each other. You, you hold each other accountable. And once this becomes your discipline, the beauty of it is that as I disciple other people, my goal is to bring them to the place where they too can experience this continuous growth through looking at Jesus, listening to Jesus and learning from Jesus. So this is a commitment I want to encourage you to make that find somebody who is part of this uh, training of discipleship. And in the next month, I'm hoping us to be around. I just want to try and help you sort of get started because once it becomes your way of life, you discover the excitement of daily learning from Jesus, daily living for Jesus, daily leading other people to Jesus. So this is the first encouragement I want to bring to you. I want to give you a little example. So if all of you, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to John chapter one. Everyone, if you have John chapter one, and then I want us, if you can unmute yourself, we will have some little interaction before I go to the presentation today. So John chapter one. John chapter one is a very easy chapter. I have been memorizing it the whole of this year. Uh, the, the first week I memorized the key verses. Very simple. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then says very clearly through him, all things were made through him and nothing was made that was not made of him. In him was life and this life was the light of all men. There was a man from God, his name was John. He came to bear testimony to the light. He was not the light. <laughs> He came to testify of this light. So I want you to look at your Bible, John chapter 1, from verses 1 up to verse 14. 
where it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling upon us, among us. We have seen his goodness. So I want you to look through that passage. I'm going to give you a minute. And then I want you to try and answer two questions. Question number one, what do you learn of Jesus or about Jesus? Okay. So if you can unmute yourself, I can see Ruth. Ruth, are you hearing me? Okay. Eric? So I would like some feedback. Once you look at, if you can look at John chapter one, what are, what are, what are some of the things you learn about Jesus? Any thoughts, any feedback? Hello, John good evening, chapter one. Yeah, yes, Jovin. You don't know about okay, that. Uh, from John okay. chapter one, I learn uh, three specific things. Okay. Uh, the first one, the first one is that Jesus was the light of the world. That's the first ah. thing I learn about Jesus Christ. Uh, and yeah. number two, uh, that everything in the world was created through Jesus Christ. So I'll and hold you on those two. Number... I, I want you to hold on those two. So for you, you have discovered Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the yes. life giver okay what about ruth yes okay i need to pick up a few a few other people sharon i'm looking at those who are unmuted those are the one ones i'm trying to catch up with phoebe okay so i've been reading i've been learning of jesus in john chapter one and came up with a number of very interesting points. Number one, Jesus is God. I also discovered Jesus is the word of God. Eric, are you coming on? And then I also discovered this talking about Jesus as in him was life and this life was the light of all men. So Jesus gives life. He gave life. I also found out that in verse 12, it says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to be children of God. So he gives right. He gives you and me new status. So this is what Jesus is. Jesus, we had an interesting discussion here. Well, Jesus brings. So the law came by Moses, but grace and truth comes by Jesus. So we had a discussion here. Jesus is a bringer of grace and truth. So if you can use a word like that. But this is, this is what I learn of Jesus, number one. Now I go to the interesting part that is relevant to me. What do I learn from Jesus? What do I learn about God? What do I learn about myself? And one of the things I learned is that I am created. He created all things. And so I am here, I exist because he created me. Not only has he created me, but he says in him, he is the word of God. That means through Jesus, God communicates to me. God speaks to me. God has made the opportunity to speak to me. And so I can learn that I'm created. And if I'm created, therefore I need to recognize and acknowledge my creator. But this creator has not just created me, he is communicated with me. So I need to discern what is this communication that is given to me. So just from that first three verses, I am learning something of Christ. I am learning from Christ and I commit myself every day to live, to acknowledge my creator, to confess I am a created being. And not only that, to open myself to learn from my creator, to have that ability to communicate. So I'm just giving you an example of how you can use the gospel of John or any other gospel to learn of Christ in order to live for Christ. So this is one of the things that I, the discipleship is not just for information. It's really a way of training. That's why I call it a training. And I say that at the beginning, 
Effective training has three elements. Element number one, it's about observing, it's about listening. So you observe what a person is doing, you listen to what they're saying. Element number two is participating. So when I do the actual training, I will get everybody who is, who is present to participate so that as they participate, this thing remains with them. But number three, which is a key important part is when you begin to facilitate what you have learned. So you learned that I spent time learning of Christ. Now, when you begin to do that and to help other people do the same, then you become an actual trainer. And that's my goal. That's my hope for you. So thank you very much. I want to go to the presentation for today and hopefully we can be able to cover it and have another, an opportunity at the end for some interaction. Give me a few minutes to just set it up. So the whole training is about reflecting Christ's vision and mission. It has two purposes, and the purpose is to train members to be disciples, disciple makers, and trainers of disciple makers. And out of that, we hope to grow the vision and mission of Christ in every member and church. We intend to achieve this training in two ways. First of all, we want to reposition or make discipleship the primary mission of every church minister and member. And the training is answering three questions. What discipleship is about, why discipleship is important, and how true discipleship happens. So far we have established discipleship is about being the disciple of Christ, making others his disciples. A true disciple is one who reflects lives and represents Christ. We can only live the life of Christ and reflect it by abiding. Abiding allows us to learn. We learn by looking and listening. And it's only when we learn that we can live and lead others. And there are simple routines like memorizing and meditating on the works and words of Christ that help us to be able to actually look and learn from Christ. We also have established in our last two sessions why discipleship is important and we discovered discipleship was the mission of Christ and the mission of the church. Discipleship is the mission, official mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the first work of the church board and discipleship makes the church obedient to God's vision. Today we want to answer the third question for the next three sessions starting today and the two questions we want, the question we want to ask answer is this, how does true discipleship happen? How does the church make disciples who are disciple makers? And to answer that question, I want us to go back and look at how did Jesus make disciples who are disciple makers? Our key verse for today is Matthew 5, 13 to 16, where Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be heated, hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. So let's answer some of the questions. If you notice, I want to do it in a more question answer session to try and get the key points. People came to Jesus and became his disciples because of three experiences. Number one, what they had said about Jesus or what they had said by Jesus. So in John 1, 35, we come across John the Baptist standing with two of his disciples. Jesus passes by and John makes this statement, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples who are with him followed Jesus. And we know what happened later they remained with Jesus and were able to bring other people to Jesus. So people came to Jesus because of what they had said of Jesus and from Jesus. The reason they became disciples were two. What they saw from Jesus 
and what they personally experience from Jesus. So you notice the discipleship engages the whole person, the thoughts, the ears, the mind. It's audible. It's what you hear. It's what you see. It's what you experience. And Jesus's method allows us to see that. To see that. How did Jesus make disciples? You notice Jesus's method appeals to the eyes, to the ears, and to the heart. So how did Jesus make disciples? Number one, he showed people the love and salvation of God in acts of mercy, care, and sacrifice. So we read in Matthew 4, Jesus went about doing good, healing the sick, casting out demons, comforting the bereaved, raising the dead. Those actions that he did allowed people to see from those actions the love of God and to see the salvation of God. And those who began to see and begin to think about it, Jesus now begins to explain to them. If you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, he said to Jesus, we know you are a man from God because no one can do the things you are doing if God were not with them. So even the Pharisees knew they had seen what Jesus was doing. So Jesus used, assured people the love of God. Then he spoke the Father's love and salvation. So first of all, they saw it. Then they heard it. And number three, those who responded, Jesus now trains them or schools them so that they can be able to experience what they have seen. So Jesus appeals to the eyes, to the ears, and also to the heart. That was Christ's way of making disciples. Ellen G. White captures the method of Christ in Ministry of Healing, page 143. This is the best summary of Christ's method. And what was Christ's method? Very simple. I will go to the next page. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them follow me. What we identify are five things that Jesus did. Number one, Jesus mingled with all people. He desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. And notice, because of mingling and ministering, he won their confidence, and only then did he invite them to follow him. Later, those who followed him, he instructed and trained them to be disciples who are disciple makers. So Christ's method is very simple. He mingled, he ministered, he invited, and those who responded, he instructed them. So you can summarize it in four. He showed the gospel by mingling, and ministering he spoke the gospel by inviting and then he schooled and trained the people by when they had come to him he now trained them to be disciple makers so how does the church make disciples today the church makes disciples effectively in three ways number one by showing the gospel number two by speaking the gospel Number three, by schooling or training those who respond to the speaking of the gospel so that they can begin to leave the gospel. As a church, globally and locally, we are doing well in the speaking of the gospel, but we are failing miserably when it comes to showing the gospel or schooling, or schooling them to leave the gospel. So as an Adventist church, these are the two areas we are struggling. And our hope is that this discipleship training begins to remedy or redress those areas. How does the church show the gospel? We can learn from Jesus how to show the gospel. How did Jesus show love? Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. We learn how Jesus showed love and how we can show love and show the gospel to the community. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? Jesus loved the church in three ways. 
what he did for the church, what he did to the church, what he did with the church. So what did Jesus do for the church? He died for her. So this is something the church does, that Christ does, even without the participation of the church. Secondly, what did Jesus do to the church? We are told he sanctified her, he cleansed her, he beautified her. So he did something for the church in order to do something to the church. But his ultimate goal was to do something with the church in order to bring the church or present the church to himself. So this is something I usually say to couples, husbands in particular, you must always plan to do something for your wife. You must always plan to do something to your wife. You must always to plan to do something with your wife. So for me, every day I pray for my wife. Every day he, she comes from work. I make sure I have time so that I can talk to her. And every Friday evening, after Friday afternoon, we are together. You'll find us preparing for the Sabbath. So I do something for her, something to her, something with her. And it is the same thing we need to ask ourselves. What is your church doing for your community? What is your church doing to your community? What is your church doing with your community? But I want to bring it also very personal. There are people, each of us have three communities. Let me say four communities. You have your family, you know, parents, siblings, relatives. That is your immediate family. You have your, you know, colleagues at work. So this is where you, you interact. So for most of you, they are students. You have students with whom you are interacting with. Number two is you have neighbors where you live. And then as a church, we have people where we worship. So each of us have about four communities, our immediate, our immediate family and extended family. Then we have those we work with, where we live, where we worship. So where we work, where we live, where we worship, and those to the families. What are we doing for them? What are we doing to them? What are we doing with them? So there are three ways every disciple can show the gospel to the people in your life. Number one, through intercessory prayer for all the people in your circle of influence. Number two, through words and actions of kindness, love, care, and mercy, and information. And number three, by sharing personal experiences with or without doctrinal life instructions. So those are the three ways that as a disciple, you need to begin thinking in terms of discipling the people in your life. Let me expound them a little bit more. How do disciples show the gospel in prayer? First Timothy 2, 1 to 4. This is what Paul says to you and me. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and, please, and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So the people in your life, your family, your friends, your neighbors, where you live and worship, God wants all of them to be saved. And the thing you can do is to be a faithful priest. Remember, in our last session, we discovered God's vision is to make the church a priesthood of faithful worshipers. The first work of the priest was to intercede and then to instruct the people. So we must faithfully intercede for all people, especially those within our circle of influence. And this is what we recommend, especially for you in the setting where you are. Find a piece of paper and list the names of three people in your circle of influence whom you want God to use you to show and share Jesus with them this year. So I'm calling on you to be very proactive. Are there people in your life you want God to use you so that they can see and experience Jesus? Write their names down. Once you write their names down, partner with another disciple maker. So Jovin and Brian, partner tip together. Your three names, your three names, share the names, exchange the names. And then every day in your own personal prayer, you pray for these six names. And then once in a week, 
you connect and then intercede for all the names. And prayer is important. The servant of the Lord in Testimonies, volume 8, page 245, says the following. Learn to exercise faith in presenting your neighbors before the throne of grace and pleading with God to touch their hearts. In this way, effectual missionary work may be done. Prayer brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellsprings of life and strengthens the sinews and muscles of the religious experience. Don't be discouraged how long you pray for people. I can share with you two years ago, well, you know, my mom died and then we, at the funeral, you know, dad had died the year before. And after the funeral, I sat down with two of my brothers who are not into faith. And I had been praying for them since I came into faith. You know, I would say 35 years ago, 37 years ago. I have been praying with them and working with them. And two years ago, I had an opportunity of interacting with them, sharing with them, inviting them once again. And I asked them to consider accepting Jesus in their personal lives. And they said, well, they were happy to consider that if I would organize for somebody to have some Bible studies with them. I organized with some friends and for the next year, they were studying and they came to accept Christ. Last year, I had the privilege of coming in November and baptizing them. And what it taught me is never to give up in prayer, especially for family, for friends. So the first way in which we can show the gospel to people is through prayer. The second way is through loving others. In John, 1 John 4, 7 to 8, this is what John says to us. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Be an authentic and true friend. There's a little book I'm reading at the moment, and I will be uh, recommending it. Very little booklet. And it says, it's written by somebody called Peter Prime. It's nice to be nice. And it has some specific ways, a recommendation that it gives to us in terms of the ways we can love people in a practical way. And this is what Peter says to us. Befriend your prayer contacts through regular social visits. Find an opportunity to visit with those people within your circle of influence. I make sure that every week I call people with whom I'm intending to interact and bring them to faith. Share words of appreciation, care, and love. Drop words of affirmation into their lives. Words of kindness, words of appreciation. Number three, find tactful and discreet ways to assist in areas of need. When it emerges they are struggling in any particular way, be proactive. Give sympathy and help in moments of sorrow. Acknowledge the anniversaries or the big events in their lives, maybe with a card, a text message. And if it's a big event, a flower. Offer to provide help, a helping hand in domestic chores or other areas. Why is this important? In, in gospel workers, in the testimonies, Chapter, uh, volume 9, page 116. This is what the servant of the Lord says. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and sympathetic, there will be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. So there is power in proactively impacting people's lives in a practical way. And number three, we are able to show the gospel by instructions. Be a witness, offer learning and direction, indirect and direct. And how do you do this? Share experiences, life experiences without formal or doctrinal instructions. No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. And so facilitate opportunities, interact, those people you're interacting with, share your life experiences as they struggle through some issues. And when opportunities offer themselves, be able to talk and share the gospel with them. So this is the way that as an individual disciple, 
you can disciple the people in your life. But I want to look at another aspect now. How do you as a church create or become a disciple making church? I want to recommend three routines or three activities of a disciple making church. I will use the acronym B so that each letter stands for one important element or core factor. So B stands for bringing the gospel to the people in order to bring the people to Jesus. E stands for establishing and growing those who respond to the gospel, every disciple in the life of Christ. And number three, empowering every disciple to become a disciple maker. So those are the three routines or three key essentials of becoming a disciple making church. So let's look at the first one. The church brings the gospel to the people in order to bring the people to Jesus. What do we imply? The church does not wait for people to come. We must go to where the people are. And I want to commend you as a church because of the, the, the I know you have a practice, you have a program that allows you when school is closed to go to the people. That is very commendable. And I want to encourage you to keep it going. In fact, when you read Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church and even the gates of hell will not prevail. It is not hell attacking the church. We have a situation here where the church even storms the stronghold of Satan in order to set the captives free. So the church must go to where the people are in order to share the gospel, to bring the gospel to them. The second point that I want to show that is very important is the church must show the gospel as well as speak the gospel. The church must first of all be salt and then become light. And the church must follow Christ's example. Now, I have some salt here. All of us know about salt. Salt has four major roles. What are the three functions of salt? Salt gives flavor, number one. Salt heals. Whenever you had a cut, you go for salt and it helps you. It helps the blood to clot quickly. So salt heals, salt preserves. And more importantly in our situation here, salt melts ice. Whenever it is going to snow, they will always uh, put salt on the streets, the big particles of salt. And when snow falls on salt, it melts. And Jesus is saying to you and to me, we are to be salt to our community even before we become light to them. In order for salt to give flavor, it must mingle. And so what you learn is that Jesus wants us to show people the gospel even before they hear it. And this is a recommendation. Let people experience the gospel even before you explain it to them. Let experience precede the explanation. When people see the gospel, when people experience the gospel, when it is explained to them, when it is taught to them, they can actually experience it in a much better way. So look at the example of Jesus. The church must follow Christ's example. Jesus mingled, he ministered. So people experience the gospel. They experience God's love. And then he invited people to the same. So a disciple making church follows Christ's example, mingling with the community to make friends ministering to their needs in order to win their confidence and then teaching and preaching the gospel to make them disciples. So the question I want to ask you is this, how are you making friends in the community you live and serve? How are you winning confidence and how are you making converts? As a church, it is important to make time to make disciples. But even once you have agreed on the time to make disciples, it is important to have activities for building friendship, activities to build confidence, activities to build converts. And I want to share with you as a pastor at Balaam Church, we had a program just like that. First of all, we reorganized our Sabbath program so that every Sabbath, we scheduled time for each of the key experiences of God's vision. So 9.30, we used to have Sabbath school, that is church at study. 11 o'clock, we would have church at worship, that is what we call the divine service. Then every Sabbath, 
at 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., we had church at fellowship. We brought food together. We ate in small groups or together as a church. And then every Sabbath from 3.30 to 5, it was church at disciple making or witnessing. And this is what we did. The first Sabbath of the month, we would use that time to train, to refine and improve and learn how to become better disciple makers. Then the second Sabbath of the month, we use that time to go and mingle with our community. We would go to the high street, not far from the church, and we mingled with our community through three ways. We had music, a small group would be singing at one specific area, and then we would have prayer stations. We would pair some of the other members up. They would be at specific locations with a signboard. We are here to pray for you and with you. Please stop by. And people stopped for prayer. And the third way we did that is to, to share literature. So we mingled with our community where we worshipped by singing, prayer, and literature distribution. And then the third Sabbath of the month, we mingled with our neighbors. And this is what we did. What you're seeing is the map of the area where the church was. And we went around the church and listed all the roads, all the roads that were around the church and how many homes were in every road. And then we came back to church and assigned every Sabbath school class a number of streets and then encouraged them, then encouraged the members to pair up. So every two members paired up and were assigned a number of streets, a number of homes in the community. And they were asked to do two things. Every day you pray, we want you to pray for your, your, your mission field or these, these homes. And then on the third Sabbath of the month, in the afternoon, we, pray, we did prayer walking. We would prayer walk in our community and we would drop some literature. And so we designed as a church some booklets, very small booklets, some literature. So we started in December. So I'll share with you, every month we dropped a literature. Every month we prayer walked and we had different things we did. So in December, 2016, we designed a simple card. He, I, don't, I hope you can see it on the screen, a very simple card. And on the card, what we did is to wish all our neighbors God's blessings for the new year. And we put in it a magazine, put it in an envelope and we were able to drop it to them. So they received an envelope like this. Inside was a card from the church wishing all our neighbors God's blessing for the new year. We put our address in there. My phone number was there. And we invited them if they would like to get in touch with us. And then in January, we went back again in January. And this time we had a little card with us that says, we are praying for you. We would like to pray with you. Please get in touch. We had a little booklet that says, Jesus is the answer. Again, we put the two together and they dropped it. We came to February. In the UK, February, and I think all over the, the world, February is Valentine. We designed the Family Life Department, designed a simple card where we are wishing all our neighbors, we were praying for the families, the marriage, the love in our community. And so we put that together with a little booklet. It says forgiveness is good for everyone. We dropped that in February. Then in March, March is Mother's Day here. On the Sabbath before Mother's Sunday, this time we did not drop. We knocked all the doors. Where there was a mother, we had a card, we had a little booklet, we had a key ring and a little flower. And we went with our children. And we all, all we wanted them to know is that we were praying for them. We were wishing them God's blessing. And we asked whether they had any prayer request. So when we came back to church, we had an opportunity to pray for our neighbors. So all of these were ways in which we were building, we were interacting. Our goal is making friends. We wanted our neighbors to know that we were thinking of them. We were praying for them. What I loved is this, every Sabbath, when we went out into the streets and came back, we were able to spend a good half an hour praying for our community. Then one Sabbath in a quarter, we would organize a program at the church 
where we invited the community to come. The purpose of this program was to be able to win their confidence. We had identified a number of needs in the community that people are interested in. Everybody's interested in health. And so we'll have a program that is about measuring and knowing about your health numbers, cooking school. So here is something we are offering in order to build the confidence. And then finally, twice a year, we would have a program at church where those we had been making friendship with, we would offer them an opportunity to study God's word. We were very systematic. Our goal was that we would make friends, win their confidence, and then through the study of scripture and through a series of trainings, be able to invite them to church. So notice a disciple making church brings the gospel to the people in order to bring the people to Jesus. Once the people have responded, the work of the church has just begun because the next most important discipline or routine of a disciple making church is a disciple making church grows new disciples. Those who respond, we must provide a mechanism by which they move from being seekers or curious interest to becoming disciples. And what does that need? What does that imply? This is the point we need to notice. We come to Jesus Christ to become like Jesus. And this is where it is important for us to train. And we use a very simple question. What is the greatest need of a new baby or child? When I ask this question, many people will say a new baby needs milk, it needs food, it needs love. All of those, all of those are good. But a new baby needs, the greatest need of a new baby is at least one or where possible two or more committed parents or guardians. That is, the, that is also the need of a spiritual child. That means when a person accepts Christ, the first task we need to do is to find a responsible spiritual disciple, mature disciple, who then now adopts or fosters them the same way we do with our children in order to help them grow. And as a church, we must create resources, routines, and structures that will grow new disciples until they become mature disciples. And number three, a disciple-making church does not just grow disciples, it grows them to also become disciple makers. So those who grow, in your case now, most of you have been in church long enough, the church needs to provide a mechanism to train each of you so that you can also become a spiritual parent. Disciple making churches empower, enlist, and inspire every disciple for the mission of Jesus becoming a disciple maker. Let me remind you something very interesting in the Bible, in the Old Testament. David was called by God to be a ruler of his people, but David was also called by God to be a father of rulers for his people. David succeeded as a ruler, but he did not do a good job in terms of raising his children, all his children, to become successful leaders. There was competition. There was a lot of, you know, a lot of, within the family, there was a lot of dysfunctionality. That's why Absalom wanted to take his throne. Another one uh, forced himself on his sister. So there's a lot of dysfunctionality. And it is the same thing that as a church, we have to be very careful that the church does not just succeed in our generation, but we will make sure that as we succeed the church in our generation, those who are coming after us don't just become followers, but they are able to do better than we do. So a disciple-making church ensures that every spiritual, every disciple becomes a spiritual parent. What am I saying? Spiritual parenting is the privilege of every disciple. We need to make a, a way to train everyone to become a spiritual parent or able to disciple others. Spiritual parenting is not an inherited, sorry, successful parenting is not an inherited trait. It is something we learn. In the same way, Every disciple can learn how to be a successful disciple maker. And as a local church, you need to provide resources and training so that everyone can become a successful disciple maker. Every church, therefore, is a training school. What does the church train? Now, the university where you are in, Kenyatta University, trains teachers, trains doctors, trains 
scientist, the question I want to ask is this, who does the church train? Who does the church train? Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, this is what Paul says. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. So everyone who joins the church needs to understand that apart from experiencing the gospel, they also called to become teachers of the same. In Ministry of Healing, page 149, the servant of the Lord makes this observation or call. Every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to give Bible readings, how to conduct and teach Sabbath school classes, how best to help the poor and to care for the sick, and how to work for the unconverted. So the goal of the church is to give every member the chance to be a disciple, but to be a disciple maker. And we do this by offering them an opportunity to train. So let me conclude my presentation with a moment of personal reflection of making disciples. Question number one that I want to ask you is this, how many people are you currently working with to help them become the disciples of Christ? How many people are you currently working with to help them become disciples of Christ? How can we make our church, how can you make your church relevant to her community? In your case now, how can the Kenyatta University Seventh-day Adventist Church become relevant to all the teachers, all the students who attend that university? And there are three things that needs to be questioned is, how visible are you as a church? How valuable are you as a church? How available are you as a church? And the last question I want to ask is very simple. How is your church helping to train every disciple to be more, a more effective disciple maker? How is your church training or helping to become a successful disciple making church? This is a very powerful song, which I believe will be necessary for us to reflect on. This is what Jesus says. So send I you by grace made strong to triumph over hosts of hell, over darkness, death, and sin. My name to bear and in that name to conquer. I have sent you my victory to win. I send you to take souls that are in bondage, to the souls in bondage, the, true, the word of truth that sets captives free. Help them to break the bonds of sin, to lose the fear of death. I send you to bring the loss to me. I send you my strength to know in weakness, my joy in grief, my perfect peace, my perfect peace in pain, to prove my power, my grace, my presence, I send you. And finally, I send you to bear my cross with patience, then one day with joy to lay it down, to hear my voice say to you, well done thou faithful servant, come share my throne, my kingdom, my crown. Jesus says to you and to me, as the Father has sent me to you and for you, I send you also to others. Thank you very much. So I want to open the, the opportunity for any questions. So if you can unmute yourself, uh, if you have any questions, if you want any clarity before we do our final.